we've now finished the portion of our course that deals with mathematics, the introductory portion. And so now we can start talking about e economic theory per se. We'll start with the theory of the consumer. As I mentioned in the introduction, when you're trying to think about how a consumer responds to an increase in the price of a commodity, you need to know you need to think about what the consumer feels about the commodity and other alternative commodities, which is basically a question of psychology. Now, when neoclassical economics was invented in, let's say, the 1880s, there basically was no psychology, or psychology was just getting started as a field. So people like Alfred Marshall made a guess as to how what the best way of modeling uh, human psychology was when it came to thinking about commodities. And we'll talk a little bit more about how good of a guess that was in a little while. But first let's explain what the standard neoclassical theory is, which assumes rationality on the part of consumers. So consumers don't make mistakes. Now, if there's some uncertainty, then of course they might, let's say, decide to buy an umbrella because they think it's going to rain and it, and it doesn't end up raining. But that's not a mistake. That's a rational decision in the face of uncertainty. So the assumption of rationality is that true mistakes don't happen. We're going to make a couple of other assumptions on what we call preferences. That is, we think about giving consumers a choice between two bundles. Let's say bundle A, which might have let's say, one banana and two apples. So let's call that bundle A. And another bundle that uh, maybe has one orange and, and uh, three apples and call this bundle B. And when we talk about consumer preferences, we talk about the answer a consumer gives. You ask the consumer, would you prefer bundle A or bundle B? Consumer preferences have nothing to do with prices. And in fact, we're not going to talk about prices until the next chapter. So it's just a question of, well, uh, psychology. What are what does the consumer like better, bundle A or bundle B? And the notion of rationality is the idea that the consumer can definitely say they like A or they like B or they don't care whether uh, whether they whether they um, like uh, A or B. They're what we call indifferent. between A and B. So being indifferent means the consumer likes A and B equally. We need to make a couple of assumptions on preferences. The assumptions on preferences that we're going to make is that preferences are complete and transitive. Let's talk about completeness first. Completeness means the consumer either prefers A to B, or prefers B to A, or is indifferent between A and B. We have a special way of writing it. If the consumer prefers A to B, we write it this way. Now that's not a greater than sign, because it has curved, was made up of, of uh, curved edges. It just means that the consumer would pick A and B if he were given a choice of A and B. And again, no money is involved. This has nothing to do with prices. It, if the consumer pref, uh, prefers B, then we'd write it this way. And if the consumer is indifferent, we write it this way. So the completeness assumption states that either the consumer prefers A to B or he prefers B to A. 
or he's indifferent between A and B. Now this might seem to be very weak, but I'd argue actually it's, it's not very weak. When we have examples like bananas and apples and oranges, most people in the U.S. know what those fruits taste like, and so the completeness assumption is a pretty good assumption. But when the commodities we're talking about are unfamiliar to people, then it becomes much more difficult to say that the completeness assumption is innocuous. Indeed, it, it might be very strong and, and might not hold. So if bundle A is a free one-week vacation to the Bahamas and bundle B is a free one-week vacation to the Virgin Islands and you've never been either to the Bahamas or to the Virgin Islands and I ask you, do you prefer A to B or B to A or are you indifferent? You might not be able to say. Indeed, you might not be able to say that you're indifferent because indifferent means you know for sure that it doesn't matter. Instead, you might be tempted to say something like, well, I don't know, let me do some research on the difference between the Bahamas and the Virgin Islands. In this case where the consumer is not completely sure about all the quali qualities of the commodities that he's being asked to choose between, the completeness assumption doesn't hold. And in the modern world with rapid technological change, many consumers are often faced making decisions between commodities whose qualities they don't completely understand. For example, a new cell phone. You don't know everything about the new cell phone, and you certainly don't know everything about all the different cell phones that you need to choose between. In those situations, the completeness assumption doesn't hold. But we're going to need to, we're going to, need to assume completeness in order for the rest of our economic theory to work out. Just to summarize then, the completeness assumption works best when, when one is discussing a decision that you've made many times before over commodities that you're thoroughly familiar with. If it's a decision you haven't made very often, or it has to do with commodities that you're not very familiar with, the completeness assumption is suspect. The other assumption that we're going to have to make is transitivity which would be written like this. If the consumer prefers A to B, and the consumer prefers B to some under, other bundle C, then the consumer prefers A to C. This is a fairly straightforward assumption, and if there really are only three bundles A, B, and C, then it's usually satisfied. However, if one has a longer chain, a is preferred to B, B is preferred to C, C is preferred to D, D is preferred to E, and then you ask the consumer between A and E, sometimes you get reversals, particularly if the bundles are fairly complicated. So for example, if bundle A is a 50% a chance of getting one apple, a 25% chance of getting three apples, and a 25% chance of getting two oranges. And bundle B is a two-thirds chance of getting one half pound of peanuts and a one-third chance of getting half a pound of cheese. These are fairly complicated choices. And then if C and D and E are, fair, are, are similarly complicated, then it might be hard for the consumer to say whether he prefers A to B, and then again B to C, and then again C to D. And then, and then, and then you could get a reversal that uh, if he prefers A to B and B to C and C to D and D to E, but then you ask him A and E, he might end up flipping. If we assume that consumer preferences are complete and are transitive, then we can represent consumer preferences 
with a mathematical function. It's called a utility function. And it's typically written u, x, y, and then I'll write a semicolon, other things. Now, in this representation, x is a commodity, like apples. y is a commodity, like bananas. And when x and y change, utility changes. Utility should be thought of as basically the happiness level of the person, how satisfied the person is, how happy the person is. Some people criticize economists as saying that economists think that the only thing that affects human happiness are commodities. And I don't think that's a fair criticism. We, we, we can imagine that utility is affected by, by things other than commodities, and that's why I wrote here this, this, these other things. All that we need to be able to do is hold those other things constant while the commodities are changing. If that can be done, in other words, if we can change x or change y and hold these other things fixed, then we can simplify the utility function, just writing u of x and y, and assume that when things are going on with x and y, the other things are being held fixed. Uh, economists like to use a, a Latin term for uh, holding fixed, holding things fixed, or holding other things fixed, which is ceteris paribus. Oops. When we can't hold other things fixed while changing commodities, then this is going to be a problem and the economist would have to take the other thing into account. So, example. Suppose one of the commodities is a fancy red sports car. And suppose the other things, the non-commodity things, are whether you can get a date on Saturday night. If it's possible to hold the number of dates you get on Saturday nights fixed while changing whether or not you have a, a new fancy red sports car, that is, if those two things are separate and the non-economic thing can be held as fixed while you're changing the commodity, then the economist is, is fine with just being able to uh, study u of x and y and not worrying about the number of dates on Saturday night. However, if the number of dates you get on a Saturday night does is affected by whether or not you have a fancy red sports car, then there's an intimate connection between the commodity and this other thing in your life, this non-commodity in your life that affects your utility, namely how many dates you get. If that's true, then the economists can't just look at whether or not you have a sports car. They also have to look at how many dates you have. And that puts the economist in an awkward position, and the vast majority of economists don't want to do things like that. So the assumption we need to make then, in order to write utility as a function only of commodities, not of other things, is that the other things can be held fixed, can be at ceteris paribus, while we change, while we change the commodities.